Good morning, everyone. Good to see you. Would you stand with us? And uh, as we start this morning, I'm going to open us in prayer. And uh, let's commit this time to the Lord. The Lord's gathered, gathered us in this morning. Uh, it's good to be together. And so let me open us in prayer, and then we'll, we'll start our service singing praise to the Lord together. So let's pray. Father, we thank you for the morning. Thanks for bringing us in. And uh, God, we pray that you'd be with us now as we worship. Holy Spirit, we pray you'd lead us. God, thank you so much for your word. Thank you for your people. Thank you for the blessing of being together. And uh, Jesus, we want to honor you with everything that we do today, um, what we say, what we sing, uh, the thoughts of our hearts. And so uh, we lift you up today, Jesus, as our King, our Savior. We love you, and uh, we're grateful uh, for your presence with us today. We pray all this in your good and powerful name. Amen. Amen. Let's sing together.
Hey, good morning. That was pretty good. You want to try one more time? Good morning. Hey, if, you are, uh, if you're new to us, we're really glad you're here. If you're not new to us, we're also really glad you're here. And if you're watching online, we're glad you're, uh, wa- you are watching with us this morning. And we hope um, sometime in the next couple of weeks, as you're able, that you join us in person to worship Jesus with the body of Christ. So a couple of things as we get started today. Um, we are launching into a brand new teaching series this morning. So just to kind of give you a little bit of the context on this, we talked about... Um, Acts chapter 1 and 2, um, back in um, November and early December, and, and talked about a variety of things we wanted to value and come back to over the course of this year. One of those Sundays, we talked about the need to prepare and to pursue the Lord, uh, and prepare for a mighty move of the Lord. And so uh, a few weeks ago, when we were online only, I spent a few minutes talking about some of the sermons and series we'll be working through over the course of this year that will help our church prepare and to be the sort of body that God will use in a mighty way in our community and ultimately among the nations. And so um, this morning, our sermon series we're launching is called God Speaks. And we want to talk about the voice of the Lord um, and ultimately talk about our relationship to God and how the voice of the Lord relates to prayer. But we want to do this because really the rhythm of the Christian life is God speaks, we listen, we obey. God speaks and we listen and we obey. And it's the way the Holy Spirit uses the Word of God and other, other ways that God reveals Himself to move His people um, in the world and to, call, to unleash His plan and unleash His purposes in the world. And so I think it's an incredibly consequential subject. And it's important because we can't be the people that God call, has called us to be unless the Spirit of God, the Word of God, is leading and guiding us moment by moment Day by, day by day through life, both for ourselves, for our families, and for this church. And so I'm excited about it. We're going to be in Genesis chapter 1, the entire chapter this morning. So as you're kind of uh, preparing for the teaching time, you're welcome to find Genesis chapter 1. Did you know today is also Sanctity of Human Life Sunday? There's actually a handout with your other regular handout um, that you were given at the door this morning. There are several Uh, ways that Anchor Church is connected to the value of human life in practical ways. You know, we value human life for a variety of reasons, but um, the primary reason is because God made people in His image. And He made people in His image, and that put us in a position to reflect God, but not just reflect God, but possess great, I mean, great value, great worth to the Lord. And as Christians, we're called to have Tremendous value for human life from conception all the way to the grave. And in any circumstance and situation where human life is experiencing injustice, um, it's the church's responsibility to be a voice, uh, to bring clarity to the truth that human life matters, that human life is of great worth and value. In our church, we um, give through the cooperative program um, through our denomination and um, on the back, you'll see uh, that the Ethics and Religious Liberty Commission is a part of that, of, a, of the organizations that receive some of those resources. Did you know that there are hundreds and hundreds of, um, of ways that, the, this, that our denomination like values life and promotes life and, um, and you know, raises the value of life in our culture and our community around us? One of those ways is that they, the, the denomination purchases um, machines that... You know, give us the opportunity to see human life and to to see babies on the inside. It's such a beautiful thing. And uh, they give these machines to clinics all over the country. And our church even has staff members and volunteers and even board members of a couple of local organizations that utilize all kinds of tools to love and serve women who are in crisis and who are trying to sort through, what do I do with this pregnancy that I'm surprised by? One of those people, hi, come here. This is Ariana. You guys know Ariana Fountain. She serves at Obria, and I just want to give her the opportunity for just a second to share a little bit about what you do and then why you do what you do. And then I want to pray, pray for you and the organization you work for, but also that we'd be the sort of church that continues to value life. So what do you think? 
I told Matt I'm not good at talking on no. stage, and everybody thinks I am because I sing on stage, but it's different. Um, so I work for Obrea Medical Clinics. I'm their social services director. It's about five minutes from uh, Northside Gwinnett Hospital. There are a few people in here. My mom volunteers. Lily's in the back. She works there as well. Um, and we just have the opportunity to love women in our community who, um, particularly those who find themselves in crisis pregnancies, um, which is such a, it sounds so scary, crisis pregnancy, and that's because it is, um, especially for the woman who finds herself in that situation. So um, what we do is we um, meet with them one-on-one -on -one when they come in. Um, we provide them with an ultrasound. We provide them with uh, testing for free, um, and we just provide them somebody to talk to. I've had a couple clients this week who have just said, hey, thank you so much for being here for us to talk to because we were so alone because this is not something we want to tell everybody about and now we don't feel so alone so um we just kind of meet them where they are talk through what they're thinking talk through their life situations um and obviously our ultimate goal is to save their babies but um we know that that's not just like a one and done thing we try to be with them throughout that whole process we provide um, education pregnancy and parenting education we provide uh, material items we provide social services where they can uh, we can help them find jobs and um, resources so I just love what I do it's my dream job so um, it's hard it's definitely hard it's a lot um, on any given day because you never know who you're going to be talking to but it's it's a lot of fun so that's amazing yeah Hey, can, you, can we celebrate what God is doing through, through Ariana's life and her service? That's amazing. And look, she mentioned several others in the church, and um, this is a church. I don't know if you thought about it this way, but people might say, well, how do we partner with these people? Well, the church is doing the work because you're doing the work, and that's a beautiful thing. And so can I pray for us and uh, ask God to continue to use us in all the ways he wants to? God, thank you so much. Um, that your word teaches us and, and um, helps us to understand that um, human life is incredibly valuable. It's valuable because um, we're made in the image of God and we have purpose and um, that you've created us for something, for your glory. Uh, Father, I, I know all around us because we live in a broken world that um, we see injustice. We see injustice in abortion and we see injustice um, in trafficking, and we see injustice in, um, in uh, unjust imprisonment, unjust war, and in murder, in all kinds of ways. But Father, um, we recognize from your word that these sort of things, they grieve your heart. Mm. Uh, Father, this morning I pray that Anchor Church will be a church that loves life, mm. uh, loves one another well, but also advocates for and cares for and celebrates um, life. Father, we pray for the mothers that these uh, two clinics that are listed in our bulletin this morning um, serve. Father, I pray for the members of Anchor, the people connected to our church, that as they serve and they have conversations and they minister, that God, you would lead them and guide them and empower them and strengthen them to, uh, to love people well, to value life well, both the life of mothers and the life of their unborn children. Father, we pray that when we face other injustices around us that connect to the value of life, that we wouldn't run away, but that we would run to, to the hurting, to the struggling, to the abused, to the outcast, and that we would draw them in, and that we would love them well, and that we'd show them the love of Christ Jesus and help them understand that they have great worth. Worth is so great that, that, that the Father sent his Son to lay his life down. Amen. Amen. Father, this morning as we continue in worship, we pray that the Holy Spirit would move in this place, would move among your people. God, we invite you to speak um, to us this morning through your word. Jesus, we love you. It's in, it's in your precious name we pray. Amen. Thank you. Would you stand with us? All of creation testifies to the Lord, speaks day after day. This next song is straight from Psalm 150, so we're singing the words of Scripture. Join together with all of creation. Sing this together, you made the starry host. You made the starry host. You trace the mountain peaks. You paint the evening sky. See 
you're grateful that the Lord Jesus is King forevermore, would you say amen? As we prepare to hear God's word, would you pray with me? Father, we thank you that you're with us. Thank you for the encouragement of what we've sung this morning. Lord, thank you for the truth of your word that we have the opportunity now to hear and spend time with. Jesus, you are the one who is the spotless lamb. You laid down your life for us, and you stood in a place that didn't belong to you so that we could have a place that didn't belong to us. Thank you, Jesus, for your mercy to us. And uh, we pray today that that would bind us together with one heart and one voice. And uh, Lord, we pray you do in us today what you want to do. Plant your word in us. Spirit, we pray that you would move us and shape us, convict us where we need that, strengthen us where we need that. And uh, in all of these things, Lord, we lift our eyes to you, the uncreated one, ageless one, timeless one. We love you and we pray this in the name of our Savior, Jesus. Amen. You can be seated. Sean Wright's going to come and share God's word with us uh, before Matt comes to preach. Good morning. If you would, please open your Bibles to Genesis chapter 1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form and void, and darkness was over the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. And God said, let there be light. And there was light. And God saw that the light was good. And God separated the light from the darkness. God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. And there was evening, and there was morning the first day. And God said, let there be an expanse in the midst of the waters, and let it separate the waters from the waters. And God made the expanse and separated the waters that were under the expanse from the waters that were above the expanse. And it was so. And God called the expanse heaven. And there was evening, and there was morning the second day. And God said, let the waters under the heavens be gathered together into one place and let the dry land appear. And it was so. God called the dry land earth and the waters that were gathered together, he called seas. And God saw that it was good. And God said, let the earth sprout vegetation, plants yielding seed and fruit trees bearing fruit in which is their seed, each according to its kind on the earth. And it was so. The earth brought forth vegetation, plants yielding seed according to their own kinds, and trees bearing fruit in which is their seed, each according to its kind. And God saw that it was good. And there was evening, and there was morning, the third day. And God said, let there be lights in the expanse of the heavens to separate the day from the night. And let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and years. And let them be lights in the expanse of the heavens to give light upon the earth. And it was so. And God made the two great lights, the greater light to rule the day and the lesser light to rule the night. And the stars. <laughs> and God set them in the expanse of the heavens to give light on the earth, to rule over the day and over the night, and to separate the light from the darkness. And God saw that it was good. And there was evening, and there was morning, the fourth day. And God said, let the waters swarm with swarms of living creatures, and let birds fly above the earth across the expanse of the heavens. So God created the great sea creatures and every living creature that moves, with which the waters swarm according to their kinds, and every winged bird according to its kind. And God saw that it was good. And God blessed them, saying, be fruitful and multiply, and fill the waters and the seas, and let birds multiply on the earth. And there was evening, and there was morning, the fifth day. And God said, let the earth bring forth living creatures according to their kinds, livestock and creeping things, and beasts of the earth according to their kinds. And it was so. 
And God made the beasts of the earth according to their kinds and the livestock according to their kinds and everything that creeps on the ground according to its kind. And God saw that it was good. Then God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over the livestock and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. And God blessed them. And God said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over every living thing that moves on the earth. And God said, behold, I have given you every plant yielding seed that is on the face of all the earth and every tree with seed and its fruit. You shall have them for food. And to every beast of the earth and to every bird of the heavens and to everything that creeps on the earth, everything that has the breath of life, I have given every green plant for food. And it was so. And God saw everything that he had made, and behold, it was very good. And there was evening, and there was morning, the sixth day. This is the word of the Lord. Amen. Good morning. So I want to invite you to open with me, if you haven't already, to Genesis chapter 1. And as mentioned before, we're launching this new series that we're calling God Speaks. So in this series, um, man, I think it's incredibly important that we're, this is where we're starting. That, you know, we, we had a little series in Acts. We did some Christmas things. We talked about baptism and communion, but... Really, as we enter the new year and we enter this like, new season and the, in the life of our church, um, as, as I begin to, to lead and provide pastoral leadership here, like, this is the place to start because God's people cannot be the people that God has called God's people to be unless we recognize that God is speaking and that he intends for us to respond and interact and uh, be a part of the words that he has to say. His words are the basis of our relationship with him, and um, we have to embrace that. So over the next few weeks, uh, I'm hopeful that we can help the church recognize more readily and hear more clearly the voice of God. I mean, can you imagine? So that we can know him more intimately and respond well to absolutely everything that God sets. So th there's a rhythm to the Christian life. Um, it's, it's a rhythm that we must adopt if we want to glorify God. It, it goes like this. God speaks, we respond. It's simple. God speaks, we respond. God speaks, we respond. God reveals himself in some way, we respond in kind. God speaks through creation, through his word, through by the Spirit, through other people, we respond according to His will and His way. God speaks, we respond. That's the Christian life. And just like Adam and Eve, you know, sin complicates things, but just like Adam and Eve prior to the fall, it's God's intention that we be completely dependent upon Him for guidance and direction, help, hope, love. But our dependence upon the Lord is directly tied to a way of living. God speaks, we respond. You know, there is no relationship with God without this rhythm. I don't know if you've thought about that before. I mean, I, I totally get that different people have different kinds of relationships, but, you know, communication is the core of relationship between people. And it's the core of relationship with God. So we need to embrace the wonderful truth that God speaks, that the God that we serve is a speaking God. So, Every week we have one of these, but here's the big idea. If you're taking notes, I want to encourage you to write it down. Here's the big idea for today. Our God speaks with purpose. Our God speaks with purpose. 
So the Bible opens up at the very beginning. We heard this as Sean beautifully read the text. The Bible begins by shouting out the incredible important truth that God speaks with purpose. When the voice of the Lord rings out, and the truth is, hear me, it's always ringing. It's always ringing. When the voice of the Lord rings out, God has purpose in it. His voice is connected to a plan, a plan for his glory. And as we're going to see this morning, we're a part of that plan. God has made us for his glory. And the truth is that he speaks to us in order to move us into relationship with him and into his plan for his glory. He speaks with purpose. I don't know if you've uh, read this text before or if you're familiar with it. I think you are because there's a little line in it that we quote all the time in the life of the church. But the rest of it you won't recognize because we usually just like to yank it out, right? You know, you know we do that, right? It says this. It's Isaiah 55, 10, and 11. It says, For as the rain and the snow come down from heaven and do not return there but water the earth, making it bring forth and sprout, giving seed to the sower and bread to the eater. So shall my word be that goes out from my mouth. It shall not return to me empty or void, but it shall accomplish that which I purpose and shall succeed in the thing for which I have sent it. The word of God has purpose. When God speaks, he accomplishes his purposes. When his voice goes out, glory for his name returns. When the voice of the Lord goes out, glory for his name returns. So today we're going to see this illustrated in Genesis chapter 1. Before we really dig in, I have a couple of things just to let you know about. Um, first of all, um, the goal, one of the goals of this series uh, you know, we have to tune our hearts to the voice of God, recognize what it looks like, tune our hearts and our lives to it. Um, but then the inevitable like outflow of this is, how does the voice of the Lord impact the way that we pray and seek the Lord? Oftentimes we have a prayer list, which is a wonderful thing, and we kind of go to the Lord for our needs. But the truth is, in a relationship, someone speaks and someone responds, and someone speaks, and someone responds. And in relationship with God, God speaks first, and we respond. And so we're going to land at how this rhythm of revelation and response impacts our life of prayer. Um, our need to be desperately dependent upon the Lord in prayer, moment by moment, and day by day. And so our desire is to cultivate a greater sense of dependence upon the Lord in, in prayer, in our listening, and in our speaking to God. So alongside of this effort, you know, this is a value we're seeking to raise. Values are not instilled simply through preaching. Because oftentimes people will take it, they'll walk out, and then about 10% of it they'll think about throughout the week. Guilty? I am. I do that. So what we're going to do, um, we're going to give special deference to some people. First, uh, every week on Wednesday nights, those who show up for prayer time, um, we're going to be working through a book on prayer. And I'm going to take the first 15 or 20 minutes, and we're going to seek to come to some understanding of prayer together alongside this sermon series. And my hope is the folks that are willing to show up on a Wednesday night to pray with us, that they will become, in the long term, missionaries for the value of prayer in the life of the church. So right now, since I've been here, we've had anywhere from like four to 15 come on Wednesday. And I know that for some, there's conflicts there, maybe a small group and, or whatever. And I'm not saying it's required, but if you're one of those people who values prayer in the life of the church and you want to be a part of seeing it perpetuated in the life of the church, I want to encourage you over the course of the next few weeks to come on Wednesday night as we explore the concepts of prayer together and we begin to seek to see those concepts of prayer infused in the life of the church. So that's going to go alongside of our preaching. Um, that's one place we pray. But did you know that there's another spot we pray? I, I don't know if you see us on Sunday mornings, but it used to be at 5 till time for service to start. But th this past week, we backed it up. And at 1015, there's a group of us who are circling up to pray. Did you know that that group is not exclusive? It's not just the band or the tech people and the pastors and a couple of elders. It's for you. So I want to invite you, you know, we, I said this kind of at the beginning of our um, 
ministry together, you know, there's an important part that the closet plays in prayer. But there's a need, I think, in our church to bring prayer out of the closet and make it a public thing. And so if, if you get done with your small group or you come rolling in and you have your cup of coffee and you go, man, it's 1015, I really want to pray that the Holy Spirit moves powerfully for the wor- through the worship service today. I want you to know you're invited. Come storm the stage. It may be your first time up here, but come storm the stage, circle up with us, huddle up with us, and I want to encourage you to join us as we seek the Lord together and ask Him to pour out His, His Spirit week to week. So there's a couple of ways we're seeking to cultivate the value of prayer. On the back end of this series, there's going to be a list of other things that we do. They're going to be a fruit of this series that are going to be things that we begin to live in a little different way. So to get us started, there's a need to embrace the truth that God's words are not just words. They're actions. Have you ever thought of that? When God speaks, he acts. I want to encourage you to write that down. It's truth number one. I've got a bunch of truths today, so I'm going to roll through them as fast as I can. But the first one is when God speaks, he acts. When God speaks, he acts. I love the little line in the text as Sean read. There's two or three of them that stand out we'll talk about. But every time God spoke on the back end, it said, and it was so. And it was so. So every time God spoke, God acted because there's no disconnect for God between what he says and what he does. When he speaks, action happens. There's no waiting around. You know, we live in a world full of empty words and empty promises. Any amens on that? You turn on the news, and all you hear is empty words, words meant to fill the space and fill up our time, words that really do nothing. It's part of the human condition. I think as sinners, we're drawn to empty words, and we're guilty of empty words. There's a tremendous disconnect between our words and our actions as sinful people. It's normal to us for words to just be words and to not mean anything have no action or motion connected to them. This is not the way it works with the Lord. As a matter of fact, his words live, they act, they move. Hebrews 4, 12 says, for the word of God is living and it's active. It's sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and spirit, of joints and of marrow, and discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. God's word acts. God's word creates motion. We see this illustrated beautifully in Genesis chapter 1. And God said, let there be light. I can't ever speak for God, but I feel like I have to make it very strong when we do, you know. God said, let there be an expanse in the midst of the waters. And God said, let the waters under heaven be gathered into one place. And God said, let the earth sprout vegetation. And God said, let there be lights in the expanse of the heavens. And God said, let the waters swarm with swarms of living creatures. And God said, let the earth bring forth living creatures according to their kinds. And God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness. So you see the action? His words are full of action. The truth is every time God speaks, he acts. Every single time. If we are speaking God's word now, he is acting upon your heart. When God speaks, he puts things into motion. Check this out. The text says that there was evening and morning on the first day. The second day, the third day, the fourth day, and so on. Motion. Evening, morning, the earth spinning. Vegetation, what? It doesn't just say it came to be. It said it sprouted. Motion. Waters swarmed with living creatures. Motion. Living creatures that move, the text says. Motion. Stars, planets, etc. Marking days and years. Motion. Creatures that swim and fly and creep and crawl. Motion. Everything that lives. Motion. So when God speaks, there's action that leads to motion. Everything that seems to, even the things that seem to sit still, there's motion. Don't we know that? You know, third grade science class, maybe fourth, fifth grade, I'm not sure where you start talking about atoms, but we know that even the chair you sit on is moving on an atomic level. Protons, neutrons with electrons in motion. When God speaks, he acts. His action creates motion. 
The only time God speaks and there's little or no motion is this. It's when sinners who are dead in their sin or redeemed sinners who choose to disregard the word of God. It's only two, there's only one time. It's when human beings who are not in Christ Jesus are dead to the voice of the Lord. And Christians who are in Christ Jesus are shutting out the voice of the Lord. It's God's intention for us to get moving in response to his words. And it's our purpose to move in response to his words. Because at, he has a particular direction and a particular set of purposes for which he is calling us to move. It's for his glory. I, wanna, I want you to think about this when you hear God speak through his word, through preaching or through your time in God's word. Or when you hear the, word, the voice of the Lord through revelation, through creation, or by his spirit, or through his people, when you know it's the truth of God, Ask yourself, what action is God taking now? What action is he taking now? Ask yourself, what is he, action is he taking in my life as he lays, the God lays this word before me? What movement is he intending? Even in this moment, what movement is God intending as we unpack and unfold the truths of God's word? As God acts upon me through his words, what motion does he intend to create in my life and in the world around me? Am I moving according to my own words and will, or am I just sitting still when God speaks? That's something to wrestle with. It helps us gain a deep sense of responsibility for the revelation of God. Second, write this down. When God speaks, he creates. When God speaks, he creates. This one's pretty obvious from Genesis chapter 1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form and void, and darkness was over the face of the deep. In the first two verses of the Bible, nothing that God made was made yet. Only God the Father, the God the Son, and God the Spirit were present. We know this because Genesis 1 refers to the Father, and verse 2 tells us the Spirit of God is there. And then the first chapter of the Gospel of John, we learn that Christ is present in creation and active in creation. So the Father, Son, and the Spirit preexisted all of creation. And our three-in-one God initiated creation with the words of his mouth. So systematically and purposefully, God created with his words. He created light. He created water and sky and land and sea and plants and planets and stars and fish and birds and livestock and creeping things and beasts. And he created you and me. Everything that was made, he made. How? By the words of his mouth. When God speaks, he creates. And his words from, word from Genesis chapter 1 continues to create even now. There was an initiation of creation through his words in the beginning that continues to unfold today. Did you know that space is forever expanding? Let this sit in your mind for just a moment. Space is ever expanding. Planets and star systems and constellations continue to be flung into space, emanating from the voice of God from the very beginning. Wow. Every living cell continues from the moment of creation to multiply and grow and divide, all emanating from the voice of God in the beginning. Wow. Every fish and bird, every creature continues to reproduce, and, in re and th they continue to do that in response to the words of God. Both people and fish and all of the creatures, God said to both, be fruitful and multiply. And from that moment, what God placed in them that is natural continued to happen again and again and again. And it, these, these creatures continue to emanate from the voice of God from the very beginning. New life. And even over time, new breeds come into existence, all emanating from the voice of God in the very beginning. And like the creatures of the earth, man within the design of God, by the words of God's mouth, continue to reproduce and multiply and subdue and expand because God spoke and is speaking. Every one of us is unique. If you look around, you know that. Some have lighter skin and some have darker skin. Some have blue eyes and others have green or gray or brown or black eyes. And some are taller and some are shorter and some have red hair. Others have brown, blonde, or black hair. God continues to beautifully create. And all of this emanates from the words of God's mouth. 
You are here today on this planet, on planet Earth, because God spoke and continues to speak. You are, uh, you are here because God has done this. He has designed you and has created you and has spoken you into existence. And you are uniquely you because God has spoken and he continues to speak. When God speaks, he creates. Third, write this down. When God speaks, it's really good. When God speaks, it's good. Genesis 1 says over and over and over, God said, and it also says, and God, we don't usually think about this one, saw. Do you see that? God says, but then eventually, after what is made is made, God saw. He saw that his word, that the things his words accomplished, that the things that he declared into existence, that these things are good. Every time God spoke, he observed the action and the motion of his word and what it created, and he declared what his words created is good. Have you ever considered that God is observing the motion of his words in this world? Have you ever considered that? That he's considering, that he's observing the motion of his words, maybe even in our lives, sinful people are the only part of creation that willfully disregards God's words or turns away from or walks away from God's words. But when we hear his voice and we choose to walk in his will and his way, I think just like God saw what his words accomplished in the beginning and says that it is good, I think that God sees and says, man, that is good. That's good. Because everything that God's words create, everything that God's words do, does, is good. If you're not a Christian today, God is speaking truth to you. And the only thing he's saying to you is embrace Jesus by faith. And when you do, he sees it and he says, man, that's good. Man, that's good. When you embrace Christ by faith as a broken and separated sinner and you come into the family of God, the word of God calling you, the spirit of God calling you, the people of God calling you to repentance, when you respond to that, that the gospel and by faith, God looks and says, that is good. If you're a follower of Jesus, then you are living a life, or we should be living a life dependent upon God and his voice, his words. When he speaks, you respond according to his will and his way as you pray and you seek his God, God in response to the word that you have received. And when you respond to the word of God according to his will and his way, God sees and I believe God declares, man, that right there, that is good. Sometimes we hear God speak or prompt us, and the truth is we respond in fear instead of responding to God. Rather than hearing his voice and prayerfully considering our steps of obedience, we just sit. We do this because we struggle to believe that everything God says and does in us and through us is good and produces good. If we believed, even if the scary things God calls us to, if we believed that this was for good, if we believed in the goodness of the Lord, I think that we would leap. The fact that we receive the truth of God and don't respond to the truth of God is not an issue of laziness. It's an issue of disbelief in the goodness of the Lord. Church, trust in God's goodness. His goodness works in, his good works in your life. Trust in those things. Hear what he's saying. Respond in his will and in his way and know that God sees it and he declares it good. Fourth, write this down. When God speaks, he gives life. When God speaks, he gives life. As you consider the story of creation, notice that every single time God speaks, in Genesis 1. He's either making preparation for life or he's creating life. Do you see that? He creates light and water and land and sky. 
in preparation to create plants and fish and birds and other creatures. And he created all of this for the good and the joy of his most important creation, man, mankind, humanity. It was all leading to the creation of you and me. The culmination of creation was human life, and it is incredibly valuable to the Lord. God spoke humanity into existence and even continues to actively create and bring human life into the world. He commanded Adam and Eve to be fruitful and multiply, and then Psalm chapter 1. I mean, Psalm chapter 139, verses 13 through 14. King David says of God, For you formed, this is God's activity in the formation and creation of every human being. For you formed my inward parts. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works. My soul knows it well. My soul knows it well. Today, we talked about this at the beginning of the service. It's sanctity of human life. Sunday. It's a day when Christians celebrate the value and worth of human life. The truth is that we live in a world that does not value life. But human life is precious to the Lord. It's worth celebrating, and it's worth protecting, and it's worth honoring. The truth is that any injustice in the world, whether it be abortion or human trafficking or abuse or unjust imprisonment, unjust war, murder, any of those sort of things is an offense to God because these things devalue what God said is very, very, very good. God's the giver of life. He loves and places an incredibly high value on human life. All of creation was designed, the story of creation, all of creation was designed so that you could live and breathe and listen, and respond to the Lord, and give glory to his name. Recognize that that God doesn't only value physical life. Like, when we talk about life, we're talking about the whole person. God also values your spiritual life. He's concerned with bringing what was spiritually dead to life. Genesis chapter 3, we see the fall of man, and humanity ceased to live in its purposes. We cease to truly live. Ephesians says we were dead in our trans- trespasses and sin. God is, values physical life, but it, it goes far beyond the realities of the physical. God values our spiritual lives. We see that in the sending and the suffering, death, and resurrection of his son Jesus, who came to bring new life to every person, to lead us to be born again. He is doing this because people are not truly living unless they are truly relating to God and glorifying him with their lives. So God creates physical life and he works to bring human life into a living relationship with God. When God speaks to you, hear me Christian friend, when God speaks to you, when he calls out to you to speak a word of truth concerning Christ or the gospel, Can I tell you what he's perpetuating as he seeks to use your mouth in this world? He's seeking to bring life into the life of a person who's lost and far from God. When God whispers to to your heart um, concerning the unredeemed, he's at work calling them through you to embrace him by faith, to be born again, to embrace new life in Jesus. When God speaks, he gives life. When God speaks, he gives life. Sometimes it's physical life, but God is working through your life today, your redeemed life, the life he has brought from death to life to see other people move from death to spiritual life. Fifth, write this down. When God speaks, when God speaks, this is the pinnacle truth here. When God speaks, it is for his glory. It's for his glory. When he speaks, it's for his glory. This truth is so deeply connected to the creation of human life. Verse 26 and 27 say this. Then God said, let us, let us make man in our image after our likeness. And let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over the livestock and over the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. All of creation declares the glory of God, but none, none like man. 
None like humanity. Only people were made in the image of God. As much as you, you like your dog or your fish or your cat at the house, they are not made in the image of God. Only you are made in the image of God. Verse 26 says, let us. The us here is the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. This is the only time in the creation story the Godhead is referenced. Our three-in-one God is relational, willful, reasoning. He's a loving God, and he made us in his image capable of reason, love, willfulness, and relationship. Only humanity can choose to relate to God or not and choose to live for his purposes or not. We demonstrate him as we hear his voice, and we respond according to his will and his way. When we live like this, hearing the voice of God and seeking to do what he says, we shine the glory of God in the world around us, in this broken world that is far from God. When sin entered the world, Adam and Eve, they walked away from their purpose in Genesis chapter 3. They walked away from their, the purpose of glorifying God with their lives, of hearing the voice of God and doing what he says, of walking in sweet fellowship and love with a father. And every one of us continues to live in that disconnected reality, disconnected from relationship with God, disconnected from our purpose of glorifying the Father. He's reflected in our design, but he is denied in our lives. So God the Father sent his Son to earth as a man to purchase forgiveness and to redeem his image in humanity. He did this to secure his highest glory in creation, the salvation of man, church family. When the redeemed listen to God and respond according to his will and his way, when you relate to him personally and when you declare even his good news to the lost in a broken world, you accomplish the purpose for which you were made. You demonstrate God and you shine his glory. I told you we're rolling through fast today. Okay, so this is six and I got eight. So six, write this down. Good news is I still have a few minutes. When God speaks, when God speaks, he blesses. When God speaks, he blesses. Do you see it in the text? The very first part of verse 18 says, and recognize this, this is the very first action that God does in relationship to these people that are designed in his image whose purpose is for his glory. This is his first, first action in their, their direction. And God blessed them, verse 18 said. What does that mean? You, know, you, you might think, okay, well, there's, there's these old guys in the Old Testament who blessed their sons. Okay, what, what is this about? Like, what does it mean that God blessed them? We don't have any real words connected to this except for the following, like, instruction or sets of commands. So what does it mean that God blessed them? It means that he guaranteed their joy. This is incredibly important. For God to bless them means that he guaranteed their joy. How? How? Notice that this sentence, I mean, it's the very first time that God acted upon Adam and Eve. He has been busy speaking creation into his existence, and there's Adam and Eve. And God draws them close and turns to them and pronounces blessing on them. I don't know if it was words or if it was just the reality of blessing, but let's pretend for a second that he said, you are blessed. What does this mean? They were made in the image, in God's image, and were in the presence of their maker. They were hearing him. They were responding to him. They were delighting in him and his voice. The blessing, the blessing is personal, intimate, loving, communicative relationship with God. This is the blessing of God in relationship with man, that we get God. Like, it's not simply, okay, well, I've provided all this fruit, and look at the animals, and man, let me tell you about all this blessing that I've given you. Adam and Eve had God. Are you blessed? Now, we, we tend to assign all kinds of meaning to that question immediately, don't we? We think about our financial position, or whether we have needs, or whether we've gone hungry, or any number of things. But 
Are we blessed in the way that God thinks about blessing? Are we embracing the sort of relationship with God that is personal, intimate, and loving? Are we listening to him and beholding him and responding to him and talking to him? If so, the way has been opened for great and glorious joy because he is our joy. Our joy is not in the created things. That's just a fruit of us knowing God, these created things. Our joy is in God himself. Our greatest joy is in God alone. It's a church family. Right? If, you're, if you're disconnected from God, if you've never embraced Christ by faith, you do not know the blessing and joy of knowing God. You don't know that. You don't know what that's like. But l- listen, if you are in Christ Jesus, you have the opportunity to live in the greatest joy that your mind can fathom. But here's the truth. Most people who have embraced Christ by faith, most people who have embraced Christ by faith are tinkering with the shiny things rather than fully embracing the blessing. Tinkering with the created things and seeking temporal happiness from the created things rather than fully embracing the blessing. And that is intimate, loving, communicative, willful, relationship with God. He is the source of our joy. Lay down the other joys as the, sat, the, the things that you, you, see, you seek to um, satisfy your heart and satisfy your soul and embrace Christ Jesus as the one who gives perfect joy. It is entirely possible for us to embrace Christ by faith and not know the fullness of God's joy the fullness of the blessing of walking with God. There's a need for us as we repent and we continue to confess our sins and repent and embrace Christ more to tune our hearts and our minds and our lives to the voice of God and begin to hear from him and walk in his way and respond to him, to enter this rhythm of revelation and response that cultivates intimacy with God and joy in our relationship with him. So many times people sit in their seats week after week after week after week after week and they receive a little, they take 10% home, they stick it in their back pocket, they try and like shape their lives in kind of a moral expectation that the church might have for them, but they never truly embrace intimacy with God. God is not some far off creature that's, that's disconnected from us. Scripture describes God as a loving father who wants to draw you into his lap and express his love for you, where security and joy and a sense of well-being come from. Where I don't know if you thought about this, but the children who who are secure in the love of their parents, they, they know joy. Children who are not secure in the love of their parents, they don't know joy. That's the way it works in our relationship with God. When we're stepping in to intimate and beautiful relationship with the Father, we grow to know joy as he speaks and we listen and we respond and we obey. Seventh, write this down. When God speaks, he also instructs us. In the rest of verse 18, God instructs them. Got to love his instructions, the first one out of the gate. And God said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over every living thing that moves on the earth. Here he gives them their very first opportunity to respond in obedience to him. Be fruitful and multiply. This command's not an accident. He didn't just say, oh, there's 25 things that I'm kind of hoping they'll do. Let's pluck this one out. Oh, be fruitful and multiply. Well, that's kind of fun. We'll throw that one out there. That's not how it worked. This command was not an accident. God gave this one first on purpose. And he gave it on first because he wanted to illustrate something. He wanted to illustrate that obedience to God is wonderful and satisfying and joy-giving. Obedience to God is wonderful. It's satisfying and it's joy-giving. I think you're picking up what I'm laying down here, right? You tracking with me? God is um, 
communicating that hearing instructions and responding according to his will and his way is absolutely delightful. It's delightful. In the same way that the work of be fruitful and multiply is delightful, receiving the truth of God's word and walking in it leads to great delight. God calls them to fill the earth and subdue it and to have dominion over creation. Here we see God's glorifying work is satisfying work. So often because of the impact of sin on our hearts, we hear the voice of the Lord and we doubt the result of our obedience will be good or joyful or delightful or satisfying. But God is saying here that when we hear his voice and we do what he says, we will know delight and joy and satisfaction and good in him. We will know it. Eighth, write this down. When God speaks, God provides. When God speaks, God provides. You know, I think sometimes we struggle to believe that the end of our obedience is good. But the truth is, God provides everything that we need. Verse 29 and 30 say, And God said, Behold, his plan's unfolding here. Behold, I have given you every plant. Remember, he sun, water, moon, plants, animals. Behold, I have given you every plant yielding seed that is on the face of the earth and every tree and seed and its fruit. You shall have them for food and every beast of the earth and every bird of the heavens and to everything that creeps on the earth, uh, everything that is um, the breath of life. I have given every green plant for food and it was so. And I've said this before, all of creation was made with us in mind. All of creation was made for us with us in mind. Light, sun, water, land, set the framework for human life and plants and birds and fish and other animals exist for our joy and to sustain us. And God gave us dominion over creation. Everything that was made was made for us so that we could live lives in relationship with God, shining his image and giving glory to him alone. He provided everything we need to live in joyful, loving, intimate, and communicative relationship with himself. And he did this all for his glory. And he continues to speak provision in our lives for his glory. Sin separated us from our purpose, but God provided a way for our sins to be forgiven. For us to once again know God and to walk in intimate, loving, and communicative relationship with him. God provided a perfect sacrifice that would pay the penalty for our sins and open a way for us to return to our created purpose, to know and glorify the Lord. When God speaks, he provides for every need, for every need. Scripture says that he knows the needs of the birds and he feeds them. How much more does he know your need and care for you? God is, our God is a God who provides, and so... How do we bring all of this together? It seems like a bunch of random truth. But, but here it is. In Genesis chapter 3, that beautiful, intimate, perfect, and glorious relationship that Adam and Eve had with God broke. And we live in the fruit of that brokenness. And the enemy comes to us every single day and whispers in our ears, whispers in our hearts, Embracing Christ by faith, it will not satisfy. Laying down this, the shiny things in this world and taking up a joyful pursuit of Christ Jesus, it will not satisfy. And the enemy's a liar. Just like he lied to Adam and Eve, he lies to us today. He wants us to keep the news on. He wants us to be in tune with social media. He wants us to live to the, uh, listen to the, uh, the, the mindless opinions of others. He wants us to fill our time and our minds with things that have nothing to do with Jesus. It's how he is keeping us from the joy of God. He wants us to embrace lies about humanity. Lies that would say, well, if, if I just do this or I live this way or I walk in my way, then I will be satisfied. I will be whole. I will be made right. And the Lord's saying, come and walk as an image bearer of the king. Come and walk in right relationship with the Father through Christ Jesus. 
and you will know joy. There is this battle, I think, in the hearts of people who are not in Christ Jesus where the enemy is seeking to keep them from embracing the truth of Jesus Christ and seeking to keep them ultimately from the glorious joy of knowing God. And the only answer is for them to repent and embrace Christ by faith and to begin to learn to hear the voice of the Lord and respond in kind according to his will and his way. And over time, as we grow in intimacy with God and in relationship with God, as we continue to be used for the glory of the Lord as he speaks to us, joy will grow and we will begin to shine the glory of God in a different way. In the church, I think, I think the church is full of people. It's, it's full of people who have embraced the, the basic truths of the gospel of Jesus, that we're sinners and we're separated from God, but we haven't pressed in the practicalities of what it means to truly embrace Christ and walk with him by faith. The greatest practicality of walking with someone in intimate relationship is to learn to hear him and to respond. This isn't a salvation issue per se, but it is definitely a maturity issue and it's definitely a joy and a glory of God issue for the church. Can you imagine being a church whose hearts are exploding with the joy of God because we're meeting with him every day and we're walking with him moment by moment. And when we gather here, it's not about, oh man, I've got to get a little sip of the Lord so I can go out and be, be okay for the week. Instead, it's I am full of the joy of the Lord, so I am coming into the house of God to lift his name high and worship him and praise him because he is my joy and he is my king and he is everything that is good about my life and he is the one who loves me well. This is God's plan for his people, for us to be filled with the joy of the Lord as we step in close, as we sit on the Father's lap and we allow him to lavish his love and his joy on us. Church family, there's business to do, I think. For every single one of us, if you're not in Christ Jesus today, there's business to do. You've been seeking joy in a thousand different directions. And in the end, it's just emptiness. The only direction that will leave you satisfied is to embrace Christ by faith. To embrace Christ by faith. To recognize that his sacrifice on the cross is the only thing sufficient to absolve, to take care of your sins and lead you into intimate relationship. Open the door for intimate relationship with the good father. So if you're here today and you've never embraced Christ by faith, embrace Christ by faith. The door is open to the joy of God for you. Church family, there's a whole lot of us standing just on the other side of the door. There's a whole bunch of us just, just standing just on the other side of the salvation door. We have access to the one who made us the one who loves us. He is speaking. He has spoken and he is speaking. He is drawing you near. He wants to walk with you. His desire is for him to be your delight. And as you delight in him, for your heart to know the fullness of his joy. There may be some things Christian friend that God might be calling you to lay down. There may be some pursuits that God is calling you to embrace. Let's take just a moment to close us out and go before the Lord in prayer. I want to invite you. Take a moment. Examine your heart. Ask God to begin to speak to you and make his voice clear. Ask him to show you. And we're going to... We're not going to lay answers to this question out over the, over the next few weeks. We're going to get there, but ask him every single week to begin to show you what stands in the way of me engaging with the voice of God in intimate and personal relationship with the king. And allow the spirit of God to begin to speak. And as he does, do business with the Lord because it's for your good and for his glory.
Let me pray for us. Father, thank you so much uh, for Genesis chapter 1. This chapter is chalked full of truth. There's like 10 sermon series in this one chapter. God, we chose today to uh, see the voice of the Lord and what, what you accomplish, what you accomplish through, through your speaking through this chapter today. And um, it's rich. Father, I pray for the church this morning that we would become a people who um, step beyond the door. That we embrace Christ by faith, but daily we get up and we recognize that our joy is dependent upon our walking in intimate relationship with the one who has saved us. Father, I pray that in time, your church will be a church that daily, hourly, moment by moment, knows the goodness and sweetness of the voice of God and walks with you like Adam and Eve did in the garden. Father, I pray that as we grow to know the sweetness of your voice and your leading in our lives, that you, you would help us to experience the goodness of your joy, but that you would use us for your glory as we shine the joy of the Lord in the world around us. Father, I pray for friends who might be here or watching online this morning who have not embraced Christ by faith, who have never known the sort of satisfying joy that God offers in relationship with him. Lord, I pray that they would do business with Jesus today, that they would receive his gift of salvation by faith, trust in his work on the cross, turn from their old life of living for themselves and relying on themselves and embrace a life that seeks to hear from the Lord and be led by the Lord and follow the Lord each day. Jesus, we love you for all that you have done and for who you are. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. We're going to take a moment to respond in song, so I'm going to invite you to stand, and as the Lord continues to prompt you uh, this morning, just encourage you to respond. Um, we're reminded that all of the Lord's promises are yes and amen in the Lord Jesus Christ. So let's sing that to his honor. Would you stand with us and let's sing together?
confidence is your faithfulness so I will rest in your promises my confidence is your It's, it's good to clap. That's right. Before we go, we're going to end with a song, but I just want to remind you of a couple of things that are going on today. Finally, after what feels like forever, we were able to start two new classes, a men's class and a women's class at 9 a.m. Uh, if you uh, weren't here this morning, uh, please feel free to come and be a part of that next Sunday at 9 o'clock. Also, Tuesday night, ladies, there is a Bible study in the book of Jude that got started last week or two weeks ago. Um, but that's, that's available on Tuesday nights. And guys, this past Thursday night started a new study called Goliath Must Fall. So that'll be happening on Sunday mornings, but then also on Thursday. The great thing is if you miss it on Sunday, you can join it on Thursday nights. That's here on campus. Also, next Sunday night, 6 p.m., we have a prayer and praise night. So I want to invite you to be a part of that. So as we're in a series beginning to think more intently about our prayer life and prayer in the life of Anchor Church, we're going to have that opportunity um, next Sunday night, 6 o'clock, right here. Uh, so I want to invite you to be a part of that. And also, February 13th is Family Sunday. You're going to be hearing more about that, but know that that's coming. Um, so you'll be hearing more about that in this, this coming week and in the weeks leading up to that. But just encourage you to be praying for that and uh, all that the Lord is doing here at Anchor Church. We're going to close with a song. This will be our prayer as we go out that the Lord would lead us and uh, we'll respond to his word. So let's sing this together as our, as our closing.
dismissed. Spend time in the Lord's Word. We'll see you next week for worship and also for the praise night. Thank you again for allowing us into your home and your life today. We're glad that you've chosen to connect with us. And that message might have stirred something up in your heart. We'd love to know how we can pray for you. You know, today might be the most important day of your life. You might have chosen to follow Jesus as your Lord and Savior. And we'd love to know that. And we'd love to give you resources and connect with you and help you in your walk with him. Here's how you can let us know how we can pray for you. Send us an email at prayerline at anchorholds.org. We'll get that email, we'll follow up with you, we'll give you whatever you need so that you can uh, gain answers and so you can grow in your relationship with Christ. He thanks again for being with us online today, whether you join us again online or you join us in person, we look forward to seeing you again next week.